first session for this morning. Our presenter will be Dr. Bienvenido Mergel, if I'm not mistaken. He is the Professor of Religious Education and Church Administration at IAS. He is also the Chair of Applied Theology Department. He is the Master's in Ministry Program Director. And of course, his contribution has been recognized immensely as he is also the IAS Asian Theological Society Advisor slash sponsor. So he also comes from the country of the Philippines. And his paper will be entitled, Church Mediation or Court Lit Litigation, A Biblical Analysis and Response. I am your mediator, and the time and space, I will be giving it to pa Dr. McGurl right now. Good morning to all of you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I would like to express my sincerest appreciation and gratitude to the EETS uh, leadership for giving me a share. Uh, being the sponsor, you also have to be a participant of the event. So that's the reason why I'm here. So I hope all the issues that have been bothering us are already reduced. And I'm coming to another issue, and this is all about court litigation, whether we're going to bring our uh, unresolved issues or conflicts to the court or just entrust it to the authority of the church. That's why the first title was, uh, was it? The authority of the church or the legality of the court. So the same uh, was this title, church magician or court litigation. So this morning, this is all about an analysis of uh, the scripture, looking into the writings of L.N.G. White and at the end, of course, I will be giving my conclusion and also recommendations, practical recommendations to the church, what we need to do in such a way that we will be able to remedy the exuberant accession of this uh, church litigation issue in the church. In uh, doing research, According to Osmer, there are four important questions that we have to answer. The first one is why it is going on or what is going on. The second one is why it is going on. The third one is what might be done. And the last question according to Osmer is how we might respond. This is in relation with research looking at the scripture and then uh, context, and then making a contextualized approach on how you will be able to resolve the issue. So I am following the model of Osmer. So the first question, what is going on? And this will serve as my introduction. Of course, we are living in an era when lawsuits among church members or against the church and its subsidiary institutions are in its stupendous acceleration. According to an expert, since 1992, so the recording started 19, in 1992, lawsuits in churches have increased over 2,000%. And as a general consequence, court litigation has impacted the various institutions, including Adventists, in terms of law performance of employees, risk of heavy financial loss, adversarial relationship among workers, and brain drain as a consequence of turnover and, resign and resignation. I'm talking on the institutional level. The state church and its subsidiary institutions are not immune to this phenomenon. How many of our SD missions, conferences, hospitals, 
publishing houses and schools have been sued by their workers in court, spending hundreds and thousands of dollars, instead abusing this money for the mission of the church. How many churches and church members have been engaged in court litigation, wasting their time, money, and effort, causing adversarial relationship and backslidings? Court litigation is a phenomenon that needs to be examined and explored on how it could be addressed. You know, this was my experience when I was president of Central Philippine Adventist College and then became the vice president for administration. How many times I have encountered all these lawsuits, court litigations? Well, of course, we are happy that uh, the Lord has given us uh, this uh, opportunity on how we will be able to uh, confront these issues. So looking at this present and escalating phenomenon, it becomes a challenge, the management. I'm talking now of church management or pastoral, pastoral leadership to comprehensively understand the issues of whether seeking legal assistance from secular court is a worthy alternative in case the church fails to fulfill its role. Further, it behoves to answer as to what circumstances and extent one needs the assistance of the secular court. So therefore, the focus of this paper is to analyze biblical passages in order to create a biblical response to the perennial issue as to whether the church can employ the juridical court for an unresolved disputes between believers and between believers and unbelievers. In order to answer the main purpose of this paper, the following questions will be addressed. The first one is, of course, what are the underlying causes church members go to court instead or instead of submitting to the authority of the church? What do the following passages indicate regarding court like negation and church mediation? And then I have indicated the passages. What biblical counsels and principles do we need to follow in matters of unresolved conflicts or issues? Under what condition does one seek legal help from the court? What leadership implications can we draw in this situation? So that's the last part. I would like to go into the second question of research. Why is court litigation going on? So I'm, I will be talking now about the factors why church members go to secular court. The first is, of course, misunderstanding and confusion. And this is what Osterhaus mentions. What generally makes church life functioning so very confusing is the fact that like no other organization in society, the church encompasses people's expectations. And there are three uh, general expectations of church members. The first one is they expect that they are members of the family, that they are members to be coddled by church leaders. And when conflict happens, once they are involved, they don't go to the authority of the church, but rather they seek for uh, somebody or an authority that would mediate rather than going to the authority of the church. That's the disadvantage of this uh, kind of concept. The other one is the view of the church as uh, a business. And because we pay our workers, we set budget, we disfellowship them, then when there are conflicts, there are problems, they, they go immediately to the secular court because they believe that is one way to settle it, according to business. And of course, the ideal is when we consider the church as a faith community, recognizing that the church is visited with gifts and that we have to work together for the common improvement or betterment of the church. So, confusion. Another one is lack of trust to church leadership. And according to Kobe, trust is common in everywhere in every segment of society, in every segment of an institution. And if trust in our leadership is winning, then the problem is there is the tendency that they go to secular authority. And according to Riner, at present there is low trust in pastoral leadership, and these are the reasons, due to several factors such as law, work ethics, failure to live up to the entitlement, feeling of church members, poor leadership, and unstable emotional maturity and confidentiality. That's the reason today the church, including the Seventh-day Adventist church, is plagued 
with uh, this secular, what's this, uh, court litigation because we ourselves as pastors or even the leadership do not live up to the expectation of the church members per se. Another one is inadequate understanding of biblical principles on the significance of the church as a body of Christ. There is a need for re-education of our church members. What is really the church? What is the function of the church? What is their role as being members of the church? Because improper education as to the function of the church and the role as their members will also affect in their behavior and their conduct. Another one is some members would like objectivity and legality of the case when it happens. Sometimes they don't consider the church as a formal and legal entity. They said, well, the church is just a church. So if you, I want to be objective, if I want to be legal, then I need to go to the secular court. So that's also one of the reasons. Another, of course, is it depends upon the nature and gravity of the dispute. There are disputes that uh, the church is incapable to handle it. For example, criminal cases. So the church cannot competently handle that case. So there is a need, according to the nature and gravity of the case, that it has to be elevated according to the context of the land. And then, of course, there are church members who would like to have an immediate and direct result. You know, sometimes the church procedure is sometimes delaying. And sometimes they said, justice delayed, justice denied. So, sometimes uh, our system in the church, there is what we call lack of privacy, lack of confidentiality. And our church members do not want that to happen. Because once the process is delayed, then the more they experience emotional pain and rest. So that's one of the reasons. Of course, another one is immature spirituality. I have found that when I conducted my research dissertation in 2001, in my uh, survey, I found out that those, who, those uh, workers who have low spiritual maturity, they have more intrapersonal, and also interpersonal conflict. That is what I have found in 2001 in my dissertation. So on the basis of those reasons above, which I have mentioned, is it now biblically supported to go to secular court? You have those reasons. Now the question is, is there, do we have biblical support? Okay. That uh, because of these reasons, we have to go to the court, secular court. Of course, we have to find out the biblical theological foundation by examining some biblical texts that support church mediation and also support court litigation. So the first text that we are going to consider is Matthew 18 and 1 Corinthians 6, 17. There are other 1 to 7. There are other passages in the Bible, but I just would like to take these two uh, passages because these are the most common foundational when it comes to the concept of church mediation. The first one is Matthew 18, 15 to 20. This is all about the model of Jesus. The context of this, Jesus was talking about humility. So the passage in Matthew 18 provides the biblical pattern for settling conflicts or grievances within the church among Christians. Remember, the issue is among Christians. Why? Because we have two words there. You have adelpos in Greek and also ecclesia which means that the context is actually a conflict between church members, among believers, among Adelphos, brothers and sisters in the faith. So the focus actually implies that the issue is between Christian believers who are members of the church. The term church ecclesia attests to the fact that the situation is between believers. The process of settlement employed an arbiter or mediator or witness starting from one-on-one -on -one process and ending up in a church tribunal if the matter is not resolved in the private level. And then Matthew 18 gives you the steps or the procedure. Go directly and privately to the brother or sister to discuss the problem. And then if he or she will not listen, you have to take one or two witnesses, you know that. If he, if he or she still refuses to listen, take the matter to the church leadership. 
And then if he or she still refuses to listen to the church, expel the offender from the fellowship of the church. The word expel is a little bit strong. But I think the, the word uh, discipline is uh, a better word for this. So in this case, the church has an authority. And it is really uh, in Matthew 18. The church has an authority. If the steps outlined in Matthew 18 have been followed and the problem is still not resolved, the church have the inherent authority to administer discipline to the erring or faulty party. The church has an inherent authority and capability rested upon its leadership in settling matters that make secular court unnecessary. So if that could be settled in the church, then that would be well. Further, it possesses as body of Christ to impose discipline based on the principles of God's words. These principles outlined by Jesus were affirmed by Paul when the Corinthian brethren had matter against another. Now I'm moving to Paul's response using this model. So I'm going now to 1 Corinthians 6, 1, 7. Well, the context of 1 Corinthians 6, 1 to 7, you know, this uh, passage is an insertion. Uh, Dr. Tobi, uh, uh, Blasius was talking about commitment and he was saying a parenthetical uh, book. If you are going to study 1 Corinthians uh, 6, 1 to 7, this is actually a parenthesis. Why? Because you will notice in chapter 5, Paul was dealing on a very sensitive issue related to last the Christians were engaged in. And you will notice that towards the end of chapter 6, he returns to the same issue and deals with sexual immorality and the Christian's relationship to the problem. And now he ins inserted chapter 6, 1 to 7. And this is all the issue of court litigations. So what is the idea there? The idea was uh, brought by Wilman. He said, Paul classifies this type, referring to court litigation, as an activity which sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, men who have sex with men, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, slanderers, and uh, swindlers. That's how Wilman suggests the reason why Apostle Paul put that as an insertion. And Steedman, father, uh, was this, put meaning on this insertion when he said, Lawsuits usually arise out of greed, out of covetousness, out of a desire to retain certain material benefits. You know, there are some people who would like to go to the court because they want to earn more money. They want to sue the organization because by doing so, they can have more money. Lawsuits is an attempt to force another person to yield to you what you regard as your right, and this is really another form of lust. So in that sense, I agree with uh, Steedman. However, when Paul was talking about uh, lusots, Worsby said that Paul was not condemning courts or law for the government is institu instituted for God, for our good. And we will discuss that in Romans 13. His focus was to delineate a fact that the sense, referring to the righteous, who are already justified by God, should not act the way unjust or the unrighteous do. The Christian has been already regenerated by the Holy Spirit, and now as a member of the body of Christ, the church, he must have faith and commitment to the authority of the church. So that's the issue. So Paul point, uh, pointed out the reasons why the saints should not employ the secular court. And here are the reasons. First, he indicated that the saints will judge the world. Paul certainly was uh, alluding to those passages in Gospels and Episodes. Swords, referring to this judgment, mentioned that Paul argues that if Christians will judge the world in a general or in a great apocalyptic future judgment, then they should be capable of exercising judgment. Referring to this kind of judgment, Steedman pointed out, that Christian will possess the mind and heart of God and they will serve as witnesses and participants with God in examining the motives and hearts, the thoughts and innermost desires and ords of men. This was the point of Paul. And according to him, the law of court by its very nature 
are only dealing with trivial superficial. So he was asking, why are you going to bring this to the secular court? The law or court by its very nature are only dealing with trivial superficial things with actions and not with urges and develop hidden desires and motives which only God and his children can do. Although the sense are not to judge the world before he comes, but in anticipation should learn and participate it in the church not only as, affirm, as an affirmation and recognition of being in Christ, but also as a recognition of the unique authority and privilege which will be fully enjoyed during the future reign with Christ. Paul's admonition is for the Christians to take life in Christ's community seriously acting with sense of responsibility toward one another now that befits the responsibility in the future. And then Paul further pointed out that sense will judge angels. So not only judge the world, but they will be judging angels. So the point of Paul is this. The believers who are according with divine privilege to judge the world and the angels should not relegate these responsibilities to non-believers. They have inherent capabilities to settle the differences on the basis of their status in Christ. He said it is shame to go to court because it is an indication that they are not aware of this divine rule and it is tantamount to an acceptance that they are not wise. Thus, for Paul, lawsuit between brothers is ridiculous. He also indicated that it is a shame. So going to the court, according to Paul, is a shame. For the sense to go to court before the unjust, lawsuits among Christians reflect negatively on the church. As believers, the testimony of the Christians to the unbelieving world should be a demonstration of love and forgiveness. And therefore, members of the body of Christ ought to be able to settle arguments and disputes without going to court. They are called to live in unity with humility toward another. And Paul further intensified the case by indicating that to employ the secular court is a defeat to the Christians. The verse points that the saints are already losing their battle with the enemy. And this is Taut guess uh, he mentioned that the moment a Christian takes another Christian to court, he has already lost his case in God's eye. eyes. The defeat spoken of was not the material loss they were sowing over, but the spiritual defeat incurred by the loss of public testimony and unity at the hands of Satan. So towards the conclusion, Paul also stressed that litigation among sins is contrary to the principle of brotherly love. The word rendered as believer in verse 5 and 6 is adelpos, which actually means brother, indicating the idea of a person belonging to a body with familial commitment. After their conversion or after their conversion, conversion in Christ, they lead a communal life as brothers and sisters, and it would be appealing to settle their conflict in public. The church as a family of Christ should be able to settle disputes when it's within itself because it is a divine family. As one family in Christ, the most powerful visual witness it can demonstrate to the world is brotherly love. The world needs to hear its verbal witness of the gospel, but it also called to provide a visual witness that is consistent with their message. So that's the reaction of Apostle Paul. Now what is the position of Ellen G. White regarding the issue? You know, Ellen G. White has some uh, references, and I would like to share to you the first reference, and this is in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, pages 304 to 306. Christians should not appeal to civil tribunals to settle differences that may arise among church members. Such differences should be settled among themselves or by the church in harmony with Christ's instruction. And this is referring to Matthew 18. Even though injustice may have been done, the follower of the meek and lowly Jesus will suffer to be defrauded rather than open before the world the sins of his brethren in the church. Lusots between brethren are a reproach to the cause of truth. Christians who go to law with one another expose the church to the ridicule of her enemies and cause the powers of darkness to triumph. They are wounding Christ afresh and putting him to open shame. By ignoring, the, by ignoring the authority of the church, they show contempt for God who give the church its authority. So this is this statement from Ellen G. White. And then again, another statement. To, to lean upon the arm of the law is a disgrace to Christians. Yet this is, 
Yet, yet this evil has been brought in and cherished among the Lord's chosen people. Worldly principles have been stealthy introduced until it practiced many of our workers are becoming like the Laodiceans, half-hearted because so much dependence is placed on lawyers and legal documents and agreements. Such a condition of things is abhorrent to God. So this is what Mrs. White said. And then one time, you know, there was a case, uh, one publishing uh, employee, you know, sought the publisher. And this is her counsel. Take this case out of the lawyers, because it was already in the lawyer's hand. It seems awful to me to think that you will go directly contrary to the plain word of God and will open to the world your cruel work against God's commandment-keeping people. If this action of yours were to tell only against those who have done injustice, the harm would not be so far-reaching, but can you not see that it will arouse prejudice against God's people as a body? Thus, you will bruise and wound Christ in the person of his sense and cause Satan to exalt because through you he could work against God's people and against his institution, doing them great harm. So this was the counsel of Ellen G. White to that brother sowing the publishing uh, department. Now, it's very clear from... Uh, Matthew 18 and 1 Corinthians 6, no way we should go to the court. However, if we are going to examine further Romans 13, 1 to 7 and other related texts and also from the Old Testament, it appears that there is a leeway or there is a provision in which we can also go to the court. And I would like to share to you now uh, Romans 13, 1, 7. And I would like to share to you what uh, Newfield shared about Romans uh, 13, 1, 7. He said, One of the most well-known and most hotly debated texts in Pauline corpus, for reason that these texts are used to justify the dis display of oppressive or benevolent authority by politicians, and most specifically these texts are used to support institutional leaders and workers going to secular court when they fail to fulfill their covenant roles and obligations. So it is in Romans 13, 1, to seven. So what do the historical and social context of Romans tell us about issues on court litigation? Okay, there are actually many ideas about the historical and social context of Romans 13, 1 to 7, and one of that, one of them is Casiman. Casiman believes that Paul's exhortation in chapter 12 is against enthusiasm. He was saying there was enthusiasm of the Jewish about their being a citizen of the kingdom and that they do not anymore want to be under the Roman government. So that was the position of Casiman. MacDonald said, well, the context is there was a problem of taxation. And Apostle Paul would like to uh, attack or address this problem of taxation. And then, of course, there was one who said, well, uh, Romans 13, 1 to 7 is actually an insertion. It was a latter uh, insertion. That's why we cannot believe from the, there is no general implications. In other words, there is no gen general principle that we can derive from Romans 13, 1 to 7 because it was a latter inter interpolation. However, the most popular and most supported uh, idea was proposed by Bords. He believes that the church in Rome had a sizable Jewish element who kept in contact with their kinsfolk in Palestine. These Roman Jewish Christians often suffered from anti-Jewish imperial policy in the capital and were also aware of the hardship facing their brothers and sisters in Palestine, the land of God's promise and elect people. Bords argues that these Jewish Christians may have developed nationalistic anti-Roman sentiments around 56 uh, Christian era, a date accepted for the epistle's composition. Such sen sentiments could only s serve to fragment the Christian community in Rome along ethnic lines. So, I agree with words, and I have read this morning the uh, Bible commentary. The Bible commentary supports uh, Bord's uh, position. So, in determining the message of Romans 13, 1, uh, that's the historical social context. But let's go to the immediate context. What the immediate context says. Romans 13, 1 to 7 is helpful to understand the immediate context. Callas pointed out 
that the Romans 13 is a latter interpretation. I give you that. Mure also said that Romans stands by itself and is not related to previous chapters and should be taken as temporary message to a special situation. So in chapter 13, he continued by admonishing them that in order to live a righteous life and to live peaceably with all men, they also have to submit to governing authorities. So the issue here in Romans 13, 1-7 is not actually a brother-to-brother brother or within the church uh, issue. But rather, the issue of Apostle Paul here in Romans 13 is all about the nationalistic antagonism about uh, the Roman government. That Apostle Paul was saying, well, you have been renewed by the Holy Spirit. You have been sanctified by God's grace. Now you are living a new ethical life. Therefore, it is very important that you also have to respect the law. And in Romans 13, he started mentioning that, the governing authorities. So, Edwards, looking at the background of the text, pointed out that the early Christians were still thinking the experience of God's children under the cruel hand of foreign rulers, that submission and love became an issue. For Paul, rebellion and vengeance is not the answer, not the way for transformation. The good way to overcome evil is to love the enemy and to relinquish their antagonistic view about the Roman government. Thus, Paul was not primarily and specifically talking about issues on conflict settlement between Christians. Instead, his concern is on issues of good citizenship or social politics where respect, love, and justice should prevail. I think my time is very, very limited. So, uh, here are the reasons why uh, we need to respect the government. Of course, he said, when the word, uh, the word every soul, everyone, should uh, submit to the authority, to the governing authority. And this is an area of voluntary service to higher authority. And here, Paul strongly emphasizing the issue by indicating various, various reasons why one in voluntary manner needs to submit to the authorities. And then he mentioned that higher or governing authorities exist because God established it. And then, of course, uh, the second, the civil leaders are not opposed to good conduct, but rather they are against the bad ones. And then the third is the authority and the civil leaders are God's servant or ministers, the diaconos, in promoting good citizenry. So where does the, the idea of going to secular court comes in? It is in the idea of our being good citizen. You will notice that in Romans 6, 1 to 7, it talks about, it talks about, uh, no, I'm referring to Romans uh, 13, 1 to 7. That's not Romans 6 to 1 to 7. I'm referring to uh, Romans 13. The idea there, why some people are going to the court, they said, well, the fact that the higher authorities is in plural, it indicates that there are various levels of authorities. So therefore, when one authority, lower authority, fails its function or role in matters of conflict, then you can appeal to a higher authority. So on that basis, they said, there is a need to go to the secular court. Another one is in the area of the word diakonos and liturgoi. They said diakonos ministers, the fact that the government is a minister Liturgois, meaning to say God has given them that authority. Therefore, when we have conflict, we have to elevate that to the court. So these are the reasons, but these are not the primary reasons, but these are only secondary in nature. Now, what Mrs. White said about this. Ellen, although for Ellen G. White, the idea is to follow church mediation, she also made a somewhat open position when she said, if possible, it can be avoided. So thus she recognized that there are circumstances where Christians have no other options but to bring his case to the court as a last recourse. These circumstances may be in terms of property adjudication, persecution, you know, when we are persecuted like Jesus, you know, he was brought to the secular court. And you know, when uh, some of us will be persecuted, Still, the government can function. We can appeal for that uh, matter. Bankruptcy, recognition of property, land dispute, legal separations, or divorce, and other similar, case, similar cases. So we still have, uh, according to Romans 13, to go into the secular court. 
So the summary of my findings, of course, the context of the passage mentioned in Matthew 18 and 1 Corinthians 6, denotes an issue taking place in the church where both parties are Christians. No doubt, the fundamental principle Apostle Paul used in 1 Corinthians 6 issue is based on Matthew 18, 15 to 20. The word brother, Adelphus, in Matthew 18, and the word sense, believers, in 1 Corinthians 6, establishes the relationship of those principles outlined. Further, Paul intends rebuke to the Corinthians in bringing matter against their brother to court is an indication of Paul's strong convictions and adherence to the model God taught to early Christians. Paul primarily teaches that believers should not turn to secular courts to resolve their differences, directly referring to lawsuits among believers, Christians against Christians. Paul implies the following reasons why Christians should settle arguments within the church and not resort to secular, secular lawsuits. First, Secular judges are not able to judge by biblical standards and Christian values because Corinthian judges, Corinthian judges as a whole or in general were either unbelieving or corrupt or both. Christians on the basis of their new status in Christ as redeemed and sanctified in Christ who would be judging the world and the angels have the capability to settle their disputes in the church rather than bringing it to secular court. Christians would rather be wrong and suffer than go to court with the wrong motives to revenge to satisfy his deep-seated personal interest of justifying that he is right and to put down the other party as sinners. Lawsuits among Christians reflect negatively on the church. As believers, our testimony to the unbelieving world should be a demonstration of love and forgiveness, and therefore members of the body of Christ ought to be able to settle arguments and disputes without going to court. We are called to live in unity with humility toward one another. The context of Romans 13, 1, 7 indicate that Paul was addressing a right attitude of the Christians in relation to the role of the government or law, curving a nationalistic feeling and prejudice of the Christians toward the government. Government or law are, or are ordained by God to minister for the good of the people. Submission to governing authorities and seeking play peace for all men is a way of demonstrating God's righteousness. Submission to governing authorities should be intelligible and voluntary and not to supersede the mandate of God. Loving and forgiving the enemy should be the basis of one's submission to higher authorities. Appeal to higher authorities may be sought for they are not opposed to good works because they are ministers for good citizenry. So on the basis of these findings, I have the recommendations. The church and its leadership, particularly the church leaders and pastors, need to undergo competency training in conflict management based on church mediation. There is a need for church members to deepen their understanding of the role of the church in matters of discipline and humble submission to its authority, strengthen their spiritual, moral, and social life, that they may develop Christian virtues on how to live in love and forgiveness, even to those who wrong against them. The church also should seek the assistance of retired lawyers. You know, in the church, we have retired lawyers, judges, who are members of the church to help in addressing conflicts among church members. And then we have also to conduct spiritual formation seminars and week of prayer emphasis to deepen the spirituality of the church members. And then we have to build trust and integrity in leadership. And then we have to establish proactive actions to protect the church from lawsuit. And I would like to mention the suggestion of Sunday. First, we need to teach personal peacemaking conflict, resolution principles, and skill to the adults and children in our churches. With such training, the vast majority of conflicts within the church can be quickly resolved between those who are involved in a dispute. This educational effort may take place through sermons, Sabbath school classes, homeschooling, Christian schools, and home Bible studies. And in second, church leaders and other gifted believers should be trained to serve as Christian conciliators, arbiters within their congregations. Then, when a dispute cannot be resolved just between disputing parties, these conciliators may step in, as instructed by Matthew 18, 1 to 6, and 1 Corinthians 6, 1 to 8, and to offer godly counsel, serve as mediators, or even provide an arbit arbitrated decision. And then third, most churches to recommit themselves the ministry of church discipline. Then if a member refuses to resolve disputes in a biblical manner, the church will be prepared to intervene in the spirit of Matthew 18, 17 to 20 to promote repentance, reconciliation, and justice. And then fourth, most churches need to improve their membership policies, a process which usually includes rewriting bylaws and clarification clarifying guidelines and church discipline by carefully explaining membership privileges and responsibilities to people before joining a church. Churches can secure informed consent to their conflict resolution practices, including church discipline. Such consent serves as the best legal protection 
against future complaints that the church violated a person's privacy or caused undue emotional distress while dealing with a conflict. And then the last, all church make a greater effort to ensure that they are following certain basic legal practices. These practices include being properly incorporated, having appropriate insurance, using conciliation clauses in all agreements, using permission slips and unreleased and forms, and getting all important agreements in writing. Of course, there's another one. Finally, churches should implement special policies to prevent the most common lawsuits that are brought against churches today. These policies should deal with the control of church property, confidentiality of church records, counseling gu guidelines, reporting child abuse, screening, and supervising youth workers to prevent abuse and employment practices. So in conclusion, what I can say is, as far as Matthew 18 and also 1 Corinthians 30, uh, 6, 1 to 7 is concerned, there is no way in which we have to go to the secular court in matters of conflict or unresolved issue between Christians. But there are situations as provided in Romans 13 in which we have to go to the court as an indication of our citizen's right. And that is a matter of appeal and also obedience to what is required by the law. So this is my presentation. Thank you very much. We now open a space and time of 15 minutes for questions. Let me probably start with Pastor Kingston. Do we have a mic? Pastor Kingston. Check. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mangal, thank you for the beautiful presentation. Church as a family, as you referred from John 13, 35, and also Ellen G. White referred that we need to suffer ourselves if we are in a condition that we have been put down by the church at serious, uh, various issues. However, I feel this has become a source of inspiration for some to be corrupted in obtaining power within the church. What I mean hereby is everyone look forward to become someone in the institution or organization so that they can use their power and nobody can question them. And there are policies. I would say the division where I come from, most of the policies, it says subject to the committee's approval. And uh, it was taken to the court, and the court has nullified the working policies of our division, saying that it can't be. It has to be stated clearly. However, we do still follow committee's approval. And the committee's members are the one who feels that they are the powerful one. And people are looking forward to become the committee members so that they cannot be Barbara. put down. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think this is an issue. Everybody wants to become a member of the committee in such a way that they can be powerful because of uh, the situation. In the Philippines, as far as uh, the legal, uh, as far as our legal context is concerned, as much as possible, we have to submit the articles of incorporation, including the bylaws of the institution to the government in such a way that in times of blue shots, okay, for example, policies, then there is a basis as far as the government is concerned. So that's why, that's the reason why our church should be legally recognized by the government as a legal entity. Otherwise, if that is not recognized as legal entity, then we have problems when there is lawsuits. That's why I am suggesting in my what's this that if possible, the church should endeavor that uh, the church should have that legal recognition from the government. But in cases where 
those policies are not uh, here, I'm talking about the context of the Philippines, is not submitted, for example, to the Department of, Le uh, de 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 Department of Labor, I'm talking about the employer-employer relationship, then we have a problem. And this is why a lot of our institutions here in the Philippines are losing because of that. Not because of the substantiality of the evidence, but because of technicalities. It is, I think, where we are very, very weak. Technicalities. So, my advice is, let us endeavor as a church that our church would be legally recognized. The bylaws that we have, the policies should be submitted to the Department of Labor so that they will know our setup. And by that, it is clear that when the church is accused, then they have something to present. I'd like to thank you, sir, for the presentation, especially the recommendations. I like it very much. My question is not really within, uh, about court litigation among Adelphi, among church members, but very related to it. How about suing the government or an instrumentality of the government when it goes beyond its legitimate bounds amounting to abuse of discretion? In case, for example, sir, the CHED, our government uh, department of education, is, uh, is like squeezing us now. Like uh, making uh, obligatory uh, policies of education to send our children uh, as early as five or, or even younger to school. Well, this is against our religious beliefs. And then the three unions of this country are still silent. Maybe we're patient. Of course, we're Christians, and we're wi that's maybe wise. But should we be silent forever? And when are we going to, to, to sue the government in this case? Please give us your advice. Our position as a church, we are uh, assertive pacif pacifist, not aggressive pacifist. So when I say assertive pacifist, then we know all uh, the legal means, okay, the biblical means, the Christian means, on how we will be able to address the issue. Not going to the street and use the, the laws of the street to take our rights. But I like the position of Romans 13, 1 to 7, because it mentions about higher government. Higher government, it means that, yes, in this particular uh, level of the agency, as you have mentioned, probably they have failed to address this issue. Then you have the right to appeal to the higher authority or to the higher, yeah, higher authority. So, but uh, the council is very clear, okay? The council is very clear it is better to be at fault, to be considered, you know, that's the, the position of Apostle Paul. But if it cannot really be avoided, then we must take that position, an assertive pacifist position in which we assert our right, like that of Apostle Paul, you know. By the way, I failed to mention some of the texts that, you know, Apostle Paul also appealed to Caesar and also to the magistrates when his right was violated as a Roman citizen. It seems that there's a lot of questions, but due to the fact that we don't have unlimited time, we want to shorten the questions. And if you have some more questions, please ask uh, Dr. Mergel personally, wherever you meet him. But uh, on behalf of the Asian, IS Asian Theological Society, we give this certificate of our appreciation gratefully presented to Dr. Bienvenido Mergel in sincere appreciation for your valuable presentation on church mediation or court litigation, a biblical analysis and response during the second a IS Asian Theological Society Forum with the theme, Issues in Beliefs and Practices, Understanding Biblical Theological Principles for Controversial Practices of Seventh-day Adventists in Asia. Given this 15th day of June 2014 at Adventist International Institution of Advanced Studies, Laya Lalaan, First Silang Cavite, Philippines, signed Nam Dorch Mandark, and Henry Sitangang as AATS President and AATS Forum Chair. Thank you, sir.